Okay, we're moving into week number three, genetics, and then next week we'll talk about cancer. So these two topics kind of go hand in hand, but we're going to talk about the basics of genetics this week. So when you look at the book, I, I think the title kind of says it all of your textbook. It says, Understanding Pathophysiology, not memorizing it. So I'm going to take a little time and go back to the basics of genetics, not a complete genetic class worth of information, but just the main key points you need to know. So we're going to go through the basics of DNA and genes, and then we'll talk about disorders that are associated with malfunctions or dysfunction of those genetics. So why is it significant to know? It's because we're moving into what we call the age of the gene. And I say that because, like last week when you looked at pharmacogenomics, we're really starting to base medicine around what's happening at the gene level, the DNA level of a person. Everybody's unique in that feature, and medicine is really kind of just focused at the human being overall. But we're getting more pinpoint direct at saying, you're not just a human, but you're specifically you. There are certain things about you that are very specific, and we're going to try and basically change medicine to work around you. Uh, when we start to using some terminology, I just want you to think of some things like genetics versus congenital disorders. Genetics are talking about passing the genes on from mom and dad down to the child, where congenital disorders, we talked about this the first week, are changes that happen in utero. So it doesn't have to be bad genes that were given from mom or dad. It can be things like mutations that change while the child's are, the DNA while the child is developing. So I kind of want to get that up front, is that some of these changes like mutations we're going to talk about, they don't have to be passed down from mom and dad. They can be something that you inherited while you're in utero. And some of the main topics we're going to talk about are things like molecular genetics, chromosomal genetics. We'll talk about um, how environmentic, environment affects your genes, and then we'll talk a little bit about diagnosing it. So the first part, molecular genetics. When we talk about molecular genetics, we're talking about the molecules all the way down to the DNA. So we're going to take our first step and look at DNA. DNA gets a lot of headlines because they use it for things like cold case files, you know, catching criminals. We talk about DNA when we're talking about things like cloning. And you remember Dolly the sheep that was cloned, so that she was a perfect copy of her, her well, quote unquote, mother. She was actually a perfect copy of herself in a, in a sense. But DNA gets a lot of reputation, and it's really important for you to understand or know what's going on with the gene DNA. So at the very end of the last slide, I kind of flipped too fast, but it says the DNA is the foundation for everything that's living. If you are alive, you have DNA in you. If you're a yeast, you have DNA in you. You have bacteria that have DNA in them. Things that are living have DNA. When you understand the DNA and how it works, it helps you understand everything that's alive a little bit better. All right, so when we look at DNA, we're actually going to start and look at, here's the whole cell. Where's most of the DNA contained in a cell? Right here in the nucleus. So you can see the nucleus, you can see all of this DNA is curled up inside the nucleus. You have some areas that are more condensed and some that are unwound being copied or replicated or being used here in the middle, somewhat in the middle. Uh, I said most of the DNA is in the nucleus because you have to keep in mind there's one other area of the cell that has DNA and it's the mitochondria. Inside the mitochondria, it has its own DNA, only about a dozen DNA genes or purposes for this DNA are in the mitochondria and they're primarily there to help you make machinery to make energy. So I don't want you to think that all the DNA is exclusively in the nucleus. Some of it's contained in the mitochondria too. When you look at the DNA, we're going to talk about this. You're going to see this double helix, what it's called, and then how that double helix curls up around these little protein histones. They kind of guide their curling. So it guides the DNA curling so it doesn't get pinched or broken. And then as you keep twisting, kind of like a rubber band, when you over twist it, it twists on itself. So it's going to go through a process called supercoiling. And then finally, we can coil it up into these things called chromosomes. And we're going to talk about each of these structures just slowly, but we're going to start at DNA at the molecular level. So what is DNA? DNA has three parts. It has a sugar, it has a phosphate, and it has a nitrogenous base on it. What's really important about these is that all of the DNA has the sugar and the phosphates are consistent, but it's this nitrogenous base that actually makes them unique. And there are four potential nitrogenous bases. When I look at DNA, I always think of DNA as being the blueprint or the recipe for life. We write recipes with our alphabet. DNA writes recipes with these four nitrogenous bases. So imagine your 26 letter alphabet being condensed down to four letters. So everything you wrote only had four letters in it. And it'd be kind of interesting, probably challenging, but all of your DNA and all your genetic codes made with those same four letters. And I'll show you a little bit more about that in a minute. So, like I said, this double helix model is just basically a ladder that's twisted. And you see these nitrogenous bases that are connecting 
the ladder look like rungs. So looking in a little bit closer, here you can see the molecular components. Right? So your phosphates, your sugars, nitrogenous base. And then these things just stick together and form this rung. And then another one on the opposite side forms another rung. And then those kind of quote unquote glue together. Right? That's DNA in a nutshell. So how big is this blueprint? Well, in one single cell of your body, like when you, in anatomy class, when you scraped your mouth and pulled that one cheek cell out, if you were to open up that cheek cell and stretch out all the DNA in that one individual cell, your, the length of it would be about six feet long. So about the length of your body, roughly. If you looked at the width of it, though, it's about one fifty thousandths of an inch, or fifty thousand, sorry, fifty trillionths of an inch. Super, super, super thin, but really, really long. That's in one cell of your body. If you looked at all this alphabet, one letter at a time, and you added it all up, in that one cell, the alphabet, or recipe, will be about 3 billion letters long. To give you an idea, that would fill up 100 1,000 page New York City phone books. In one cell, that's how much information you have. It's pretty impressive. If you were to type that out, it would take you about 60 words per minute, 8 hours a day for about 50 years to type out your own DNA code. So pretty incredible. Fitting that stuff in the nucleus is kind of like fitting about 24 miles of string into one little tennis ball. So really, really long, but very, very narrow. It's kind of impressive when you think about it. And this is your DNA. What's also kind of cool is it would take about three gigabytes worth of memory. So imagine your hard drive in your computer, if it had three gigs on it, that would be what's, what kind of memory is in one cell of your body. Is all of it useful? No, absolutely not. In fact, our genes or our DNA, when you look at it, only about 5% of our DNA is actually worth anything. The rest of it we refer to as junk. When you look at other creatures like bacteria, about 90% of the bacteria DNA is worthwhile. I mean, it's valuable. So a lot of ours is actually junk. It's kind of incredible when you look at it. When you look at um, what we code for, we've got about 3,000 genes that we code for, where something like a newt has about 84,000 genes it codes for. Even an amoeba has about 670,000 genes. So it's kind of impressive, um, you know, the DNA, what we do with ours, very little coding, we get a lot done. So next concept is DNA replication. There are two reasons you want to replicate DNA. One is to pass that DNA down to your offspring. So from one generation to the other. The other one is to repair yourself. So for you to grow and fix yourself, you need to copy DNA, you need to copy cells, and you grow and fix you. So when we talk about those two processes, we basically are pointing fingers at mitosis and meiosis. So the easiest way to remember mitosis versus meiosis is mitosis makes twin cells. When it replicates the DNA, both sets of DNA are exactly the same, and then it makes a second cell. When you look at meiosis, the I in the center says these are going to be individual cells. The DNA in every one of those cells are extremely different than the one before them. Right? So when you look at the two processes, the meiosis is more for replication. That's why your children don't look exactly like you. They look like a blend of the parents. And then mitosis is for growth and repair. That's why one skin cell should look exactly like another skin cell. When that skin cell replicates its DNA in itself, it makes a perfect copy. So we're going to talk about these two um, pathways a little bit more in detail. But here you can see kind of a handy uh, chart where meiosis you make individuals. Man makes a sperm that's individual. Woman makes an egg that's individual. They come together and they make this brand new organism. For that organism to grow, it goes through mitosis. Every cell in this baby's body is going to be exactly the same DNA, except red blood cells that don't have DNA in them. But that's a whole other story. So mitosis is allowing this child to grow. When it gets a cut, it's helping it repair. Right, so we're gonna talk about the cell cycle actually more next week when we talk about cancer. But when we're talking about mitosis and replication, it's interesting because there's a pathway, kind of a growth pathway for a cell. It goes through this phase called interphase. It's a long, long, long phase. And then when it's ready to replicate, it basically goes through this like pregnancy stage where it's going to eat lots of food, it replicates its DNA, it starts growing more organelles, and then it splits and becomes two cells. And if this is mitosis, what do you know about these two cells? Are they individuals or twins? They're twins, they're exactly the same. So the DNA replication, if you look down at the DNA, remember that super coil? If you unwound it, then the rungs of the ladder can actually split apart and what happens during DNA replication is you have this copy machinery, it's called a polymerase. 
that goes along the DNA and makes an exact mirror image of the DNA. So you can see if you look at the letters on this piece of DNA, you've got C, T, G, but when you make a perfect copy, it's not C, T, G. You can see the T's pair up with A's, the G's pair up with C's, so if you had to predict what this letter would pair up with, what would it be? Well, look at that code. C's pair up with G's. T's pair up with A's. So if you followed along, look for another C, there's a C paired up with a G. It's kind of an easy pattern. So they always pair up like this, making the, the alphabet just a little bit more complicated. If it weren't tough enough having only four letters, every letter has to pair up with its counterpart, its complement. Right. So replication, what happens is you unwind this ladder and then you make a brand new strand that's a mirror image of the old strand. So in reality, this brand new strand will be exactly the same as this other side of the ladder. When we go through replication, they actually call it something called semi-conservative because as you're peeling this apart, you're taking the old strand, you're sticking on a new strand. This is going to be your new, quote-unquote, copy of the DNA. So that brand new cell is going to get half old DNA and half new DNA. It's called semi-conservative replication. This is important especially for things like mutations. Accidents happen when you're copying these genes. Sometimes this strand over here will have a glitch that doesn't allow it to be exactly like the original strands. We'll talk about those things called mutations. Right. So mitosis, you probably remember the phases. I always remember P, mati. So prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and then back to interphase. And you see them, there's significant characteristics of each. Like prophase, you have the con condensation of the, the chromosomes. So all that loose DNA is going to start thickening up. It's super coiling, it's winding together. And then you have the chromosomes. During metaphase, they all line up across the middle plate. And they call it the metaphase plate, like you can see down here. And then anaphase, they rip apart. And then with telophase, these two brand new cells start dipping in. They form this thing called a cleavage furrow. They start dipping in and then they separate through a process called cytokinesis. So you probably remember that and I'm not going to spend a lot of detail, but when we talk about cancers, you're going to definitely want to be refreshed on the cell cycle. Right? So mitosis versus meiosis. Remember, mitosis makes twins, meiosis makes individuals. The cycles look almost exactly the same. The big difference is that meiosis goes through twice what mitosis does. So if mitosis goes through prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, Myos will actually go through prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and then back through prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and then telophase. So instead of just making two copies like mitosis does, it'll take and make two copies, but then rip them in half, so you actually have four overall. And look at those. The four of them are actually individuals. They don't look like the original cells. So meiosis, like I said, you go through prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and they call them ones after each of them. And then what do you do? You go through them again. Prophase 2, metaphase 2, anaphase 2, telophase 2. So that, that way you start with one cell, you replicated it and made two, but you're not done. You take those two cells and then you split them again so you have four all together. If you need a refresher on mitosis or meiosis or the differ differences, here's actually a quick overview that you can use as a reference. So I'm not going to put this stuff on test. This is actually for your benefit in your understanding. So when you look at the similarities they both have in common, the ways that they divide, they're going to replicate their chromosomes, they go through phases like prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. The big difference is what they come out with at the end. Right, the first question, so homework question number one, in Kleinfelder syndrome, Turner syndrome, and Down syndrome, they're all disorders or examples of how meiosis can cause disease. Something went wrong in meiosis. So what I'm going to have you do is you're going to explain how meiosis causes most cases of Down syndrome. When we talk about Down syndrome later, I'll actually talk about some exceptions to this rule. But there's something that happens in meiosis that causes Down syndrome. And what I want you to do is just, you can Google it. You can be specific and you can find exactly what you want by looking up meiosis and then type the plus sign, Down syndrome, type the plus sign, and etiology. And you'll find that when you use more words in your search, it'll get more specific. And then, of course, remember, you want to look for things like .gov, .edu, .org, and you want to look for things that aren't biased, too. So meiosis plus Down syndrome plus etiology, and you're going to find out what it is about meiosis that causes problems like Down syndrome. 
And like I said, again, understanding, not memorizing. When you understand how Down syndrome happens, it'll help you understand how Turner syndrome happens, how Kleinfelder syndrome happens that we're going to talk about later. So right now, remember, it's learning the tools, the basics. Pause and then start it back up when you get that written down. All right, next concept. So DNA is the key to the central dogma of life. And they call it the central dogma because all life revolves around DNA. In fact, three steps here. So you have the DNA. The DNA will either replicate, make a copy of itself, or the DNA will open up and make basically a, a new code for you to use something or do something with. So DNA goes to RNA. RNA is like the little individual recipe copy that you can use to make a final product. And that final product is a protein. So the central dogma means that everything that revolves around life starts as DNA, goes to RNA, and then finally turns into a protein. And proteins help you live. They break down fats, they break down carbohydrates, they'll break down other proteins. Proteins help run the machinery in your body. They give you structure. And if you remember from the cell lecture, you know, they give you the cytoskeleton structure, they give you receptors on the membrane. So proteins are super important, but DNA always codes to make an RNA and a protein. So let me elaborate. Okay, so DNA holds those recipes, I like to call them. And I, if you know me by now, I use a lot of analogies to help remember things. So there are a couple of analogies you can think of with proteins. First, proteins are made out of amino acids. So you can think of amino acids as the building blocks or the Lego blocks for proteins. So your whole body is basically a protein skeleton. Your skin has a has protein skeleton structure in, inside each cell. Your organs, every organ has a protein skeleton structure inside of it. Even your skeleton, your bones, have a protein scaffolding inside of them. So you have these individual Legos, when they're put together in the right order, they can actually build something great, like you. So you can think of these codes as directions on how to assemble the amino acids to build these protein structures. So. Here it all starts with something we call the genome. The genome's the whole complex, all the DNA, all the codes of the DNA that you have in your system. Each of those DNA, or each of those genomes, has basically a small library. And each book in the library is considered a chromosome. So each of those chromosomes, one might be for how to repair your house, one might be for how to cook a meal, one might be for how to repair your car, whatever. But your chromosomes are directions on how to do specific things in your body. Right? If we open up the chromosome, so we open the book up and look at individual pages, each page might have a, a direction on how to do specific things. Like if it's a book on how to tune your car, one page might be how to fix the battery. Another page may, may be how to change your oil. Another page may be how to change your light bulb. So when you look, the genome is the entire library. A chromosome is one book, and the gene is just one page. Right? And then that one page will give you directions on making that final product or doing that final product. So think of it in analogies, right? So again, understanding. So here's how we make a protein. Right? Making a protein is kind of like using a recipe. So of that library, I'm going to choose a cookbook for the analogy. I love this analogy. This is actually from another text that I teach out of. But I used to use this analogy. Funny. I used it before I even opened that textbook. But I always think of my grandmother's cookbook as being my favorite book. So everything my grandmother ever made, she was a great cook. Everything she ever made was in her cookbook. It, she'd been gathering these recipes forever, like however old she was, what she was, like four or five hundred years old. But lots and lots of recipes. I'm kidding, exaggerating, of course. From those, that cookbook, if I wanted a recipe, I don't get to take it out of her kitchen. It's stuck in her kitchen. So think of the nucleus as the kitchen of the cell. It's where all the cookbooks are at. It's where the recipes are stored. It's where the recipes are held. If I wanted to get a copy of a recipe, I couldn't take that cookbook home with me. I had to walk in with a little piece of paper and write that recipe down. So we're going to go through a process called transcription, which literally means to, to write. When you transcribe something, you write something. So we're going to write a copy of that recipe called transcription. Right? Then we're going to take that recipe out of her kitchen. We're moving it out of the kitchen and into the cytoplasm, so outside her house. I can take it, and I can take it over to a friend's house if I want. I can make it there. I can take it back to my own kitchen, which would be the equivalent of the rough endoplasmic reticulum, where you make proteins in a cell, and I can make the stuff there. When I make things from that recipe, I am translating her recipe into my own creation. So my dad's mom actually only spoke German, and her recipes would have been in German. So imagine, you take and you copy all that German down letter for letter, even if you didn't understand what, hap you know, what it means. You take it out to your kitchen, you invite your German friend over, and they translate it for you to make your recipe. 
So translation is the process of reading the recipe and making the product. And then of course the final product is going to be a protein molecule that we already learned about, but in our analogy you might imagine as chocolate chip cookies. So I love this analogy and hopefully it helps stick things in your head. All right. So the first step is that transcription to write. So here we have a strip of DNA. The first thing we have to do is we have to open up the DNA. So the DNA is tight and coiled. What we're going to do is we're going to peel it open and we're going to make a copy of it. All right. So we peel this thing open. We're going to zoom right along and we're going to make that complement or mirror strand, remember? So if this is the original DNA, whatever we write from it has to be an exact opposite because you can't put a T straight to a T. So just the opposite is always going to be T to A, okay? G to C, and here's an exception. When you're copying DNA to DNA, the G and the C always pair together, and the A and T always pair together. But when you copy DNA to something called RNA, which is the recipe code, something has to change, and what changes is the letter T. The RNA never has the letter T on it. Instead, it puts a U in its place. That way we know this is a strip of RNA. I like to think of it as this way. The DNA has to stay inside the nucleus or inside the mitochondria. If it ever escapes, you know, it's bad news. The way the cell recognizes that DNA escaped the nucleus is because if that strip of amino, or amino acids, that strip of nucleic acids has a T on it, it says it's DNA and it'll be destroyed in the cytoplasm. But this RNA has the U on it. So if it gets to the cytoplasm, then that U is preserved. Or the strip of RNA is preserved because of the U. Right? So again, that they call it the complementary strand because it's not exactly the same. It's like a mirror image. Right? And this is called RNA. Right? And the HN just stands for heterogeneous nuclear RNA, which is not a big deal for me. It's, the idea of RNA came from DNA is most important. Right? So I put down details in case you ever want to use this for studying anything or you want to go into better detail and understand it better. That's exciting. So you've got this little machinery called a polymerase. It's an enzyme because it ends in ACE. And polymer means it's making a long chain. So this RNA polymerase is making a long chain of RNA. It's an enzyme. Right. Now we go to something called post-transcription modification. So we've just written it. I've made my recipe on a note card. But it's such a precious recipe, I want to do something. First, I want to clean it up. So I'm going to clean it up and tidy it up. Cleaning the junk is what's referred to as removing the introns and keeping the extron, extron, exons. Sorry. Give me a little stutter there. So here you have this long strip of DNA. Remember, all this junk in between is worthless. Only about 5% of your DNA is worth anything. So here's a gene, a recipe. Here's another recipe. This is just filler paper. So when you make a copy of this gene recipe, you get some of that filler paper with it. So what we're going to do is we're going to clean it up. We're going to kind of chop off the ugly ends of it and make it nice and tidy. tidy. The introns are the ugly junk ends. The exons are the important part, the actual gene itself. So you can see grandma put her little notes inside the recipe. I don't need those. I'm going to just take the parts that are most important and squeeze them together. And then once I have this all cleaned up, then I'm going to cap it. And the capping is like laminating it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that note card that's nice and clean and pristine, and I'm going to put a laminate over it so that when I'm working in the kitchen, it doesn't stain, it doesn't get markings on it, it doesn't get all you know nasty. Your RNA is exactly the same way. It's so precious. You want to cap it, you want to kind of laminate it, and they're going to stick a label on it so that you know what file to put it in, right? Your recipe has to have a specific place. So the labeling tells the RNA what part of the cell it needs to go to. So where's it going to be replicated? So I borrowed this picture again from another textbook I teach out of. And with transcription, you can see you unwind the DNA. That polymerase comes cruising along. It makes your strip of RNA here, and then that RNA is going to be edited. So you're going to cut out these introns, and you're going to take these important pieces the exons and stick them together. When you're all done, you're going to laminate that and you're going to put little caps on the end. So they call them the tail and the cap. So you laminate that sheet and then you put little shipping labels on. The cap and the tail are, are more for like making sure that this thing doesn't unravel inappropriately. So that's kind of the overview of what's happening. All right, second question, so homework question number two. Why is this stuff important? So myotonic dystrophy Huntington's disorder and fragile X are all examples of genetic disorders that are caused by something called a repeating sequence. The cap and the tail are repeating sequences. They're really important. They're kind of like, they're still junk. They're telling the structure, the RNA, this is the very ends, protect it. They're kind of capping it off. They're preventing it from unraveling. But some diseases have that same repeating sequence that causes the disease. 
the longer that repeating sequence gets, the worse the disease gets. So your homework to look into this a little bit is what's the name of a group of muscle disorders that myotonic dystrophy falls into? Okay. So there's a, a general name for this type of disease, a bigger group. Give me a brief etiology, so what's the problem? I kind of already explained the problem with repeating sequences, but what's the problem here? Right? And then what's the prevalence? So remember, differentiate between incidence and prevalence. So you can put the incidence in too, as long as you have the prevalence. So how many people, well, you're gonna figure that out. You should know the two terms. And then my, sorry, myotonic dystrophy, what's the most common, or is the most common type of what? Which is up here, and then what age group does it affect primarily? So this big group of disorders is actually a huge group of disorders, but this specific type affects a primary age group, and who are they? Pause and come back when you're done with that. Okay, winding down. So now that we have transcription done, remember the second thing is going to be translation. So you have to be able to read it. So we've done the transcription. We did our copying, put on a note card, clean up the note card, note card laminate it, cap it, and then move it out to the cytoplasm. Here's where it's gonna be translated. Right? So we're gonna actually take that recipe and do something with it. So translation is kind of a cool process. Here you can see all the steps of translation. You can see the little structures and the machinery that are important for it. You can see here's your piece of mRNA. You can see that here are little amino acids forming a long what? What do amino acids form? Proteins, so polypeptides are proteins. So those names are interchanged a lot. All right, let's talk about it. So here you can read through if you want to, but I'm just going to summarize. So when you're going through translation, you actually have special parts that are called RNA. The RNA we put on a note card is the recipe, and we call that the messenger RNA or the mRNA. There's another RNA that's the machinery, and it's called ribosomal RNA because it makes ribosomes that make proteins. Right? The third type of RNA is this tRNA, and the tRNA actually carries in or brings in the amino acids. So the amino acids will stick to the end of the tRNA. The tRNA has a special code and it matches the code on the recipe. So it just starts building on. I'll show you that in just a second. All right. So strips of RNA are written in sentences. So your recipe is written in sentences. And what's interesting is that the sentences, all of the words are made out of three letters. So if I have this code this G, C, and A, what could potentially be the fourth letter on an RNA? Would it be a T or would it be a U? It would be a U. So when you look at these three letter codes down here, here are all the possible three letter codes for making an amino or for coding for an e amino. So you can see a UUU is a code, UUC is a code, and they translate for something called phenylalanine, which if you remember physiology, it was a chemical that build up, builds up in the brain potentially in people that have something called phenylketonuria. So here's your three letter word. right? So every word on here, maybe it says one EGG, an egg. Maybe it says one SUG, so maybe one cup of, what would SUG be? Sugar. Maybe it's one H2O, which would be water. So maybe it's one BUT, but all these words on this recipe sheet would be three letter words, and those are called codons. So when you make a sentence out of these codons, every sentence has a word that's only three letters long. Right. So I'm just going to use the, the terms later. So again, the main key ingredients you have to have to make this recipe is you have to have your first mRNA, messenger RNA, which is the recipe. Okay. You have something called a tRNA, transfer RNA, which is kind of like it carries amino acids. And amino acids would be like little tiny eggs in this carton. And then ribosomal units, or rRNA, those are the machinery. When you have all these pieces, you can actually make a protein. You have to have the ingredients, the amino acids. Remember, proteins are made out of amino acids. You have to have something that transfers the amino acids, so some kind of container that brings it to you. And then you have to have the machinery to mix it. So here's an example of it. Here's the tRNA. Here it has this one little ingredient stuck in its container. Here's the recipe. So now that you have all three pieces, the recipe calls for one AUG, remember to complement. So just in reverse or mirror image, you have a UAC, which codes for this one amino acid. So it knows this ingredient is right there. It plugs together and holds onto that for the protein, which I'll show you in a second. So in this example, you can see an egg. So the egg's the amino acid. Here's your tRNA. You put them together, you have the tRNA bound with amino acid. 
your recipe is down here and your recipe tells you each of the ingredients. Right. So translation, here you can see the ribosomal RNA. Here you can see those tRNAs bringing the ingredients along. Bink, it plugs in and it will stick this amino acid to that one and then makes this long chain. The next ingredient comes in. Bink, sticks this amino acid on. Next ingredient sticks this amino acid on. It just keeps getting longer and longer and longer forming a protein. That's called translation. Right. Homework question number three. So remember, a codon is like a three-letter word. It identifies one amino acid or one ingredient in your recipe. Sickle cell anemia, hemophilia, hemochromatosis, they're all examples of blood disorders that are caused by one change in a codon. So one ingredient in that protein is wrong. What I want you to do is you're going to Google this, or however your search engine is, and you're going to look at what's the etiology of sickle cell anemia. So what exactly is happening? Don't remember, don't go overboard in these explanations. Just one or two sentences are fine by me. Okay? So how do these people get it? What structure is changing in the red blood cell? So don't tell me the red blood cell changes. What structure is changing in the red blood cell because of sickle cell anemia? Right? How many codons changed to cause sickle cell anemia? So how many of the ingredients in the red blood cell changed? What's the prevalence? And then what are some signs and symptoms? So what's the potential fate of somebody that has sickle cell? So you can see we're building on genetics. We're understanding why the genetics are important, and then we're actually looking at the disease. So some common symptoms, the cause of the disease, and I'm slowly building you into it. So you're going to hit, actually you can write this down and then stop because this is the end of the first lecture.